and follow him. And that leads perfectly into our message today, which is following God without listening to God. And I don't know about you, but as you read through your Bible, there are times where I am troubled by what I read. And in fact, there are times where I look at things that happen and I go, man, God seems to be kind of finicky or picky. Why is he being so narrow-minded? And I think it's good because when we look at that, we need to understand that God, unlike human beings, is not subject to being narrow-minded or picky. But it is interesting as we read these cases to understand them better. And such is the case of David and the Ark of the Covenant and a man named Uzzah. And our scripture today is coming from 1 Chronicles 13, verses 1 through 14. And I need to give you just a little background because what has happened here is under Saul, the previous king, the Philistines had attacked Israel and they went out to fight and they lost. Saul and his son Jonathan died in the battle and the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant, perhaps one of the most holy objects in all of Israel, and they took it captive. But when they had it in their own temple as a sign of their victory and their superiority over the Israelites, they began to suffer. And so it was determined that it was time to give the Ark of the Covenant back to the people. And so we're picking up the story of where they have come back and the Ark of the Covenant is going to be returned to Israel and to Jerusalem. And we start with verse 1 saying, David consulted with the commanders of thousands and hundred thousands with every leader. And David said to all the assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you from the Lord your God, let us send abroad to our brothers who remain in the lands of Israel as well as the priests and the Levites in the city and that have pasture lands and that have gathered unto us and then let us bring the ark of our God to us for we did not seek it in the days of Saul. All the assembly agreed to do so for the thing was right in their eyes of all the people. So David assembled all of Israel from Nile of Egypt to and I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, Libo Hamath, to bring the Ark of the Covenant from Kerith, Jerim, to, and David and all of Israel went up to Bela, that is Kerim, Jeriah, that belongs to Judah, to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord, who sits enthroned above the cherubim. And they carried the Ark of the Covenant on a new cart from the house of Abinab and Uzzah, and Ohio were driving the cart, and David and all of Israel were celebrating before God with all their might, with songs, lyrics, with harps, tambourines, I can't talk today, and cymbals and trumpets. And when they came to the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put up his hand to take hold of the ark, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And he struck him down because he had put his hand on the ark and he died there before God. And David was angry because the Lord had been broken up out against Uzzah. And the price was called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day. And he said, how can I bring the ark of God home to me? So David did not take the ark home in the city of David, but took it aside to the house of obed Edom, the Gideite. And the ark remained at the house of Obed-Edom in his house for three months. And the Lord blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that he had. Now, the ark of the covenant was one of those things that was, as I said, considered quite holy. And for most of you who are old enough to remember the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, the people of Israel held it with high esteem and so did everyone else. And I think when we look at the Ark of the Covenant, too many things misunderstood. From the movie, the Nazis said that any army that marched with the Ark could not be defeated. 
Well, obviously they didn't read the Bible because the Israelites took the ark out and were defeated by the Philistines. The ark represented God with his people. It represented the judgment seat of God. In fact, as this scripture says, it was implied that God would sit on that ark to have judgment over Israel. That ark was to be handled in a very specific manner. It was never to be touched by anyone. And it was only to be carried by the Levites by long poles. And that, unfortunately, was not being done. Now the Philistines, not knowing any better and not having poles, probably just did the best they could with a cart. And they sent it back to Israel. And Israel says, hey, the ark's back, hallelujah. And it's already on a cart, but they build a new cart because they weren't going to use the Philistine cart. And they're going to take it in. But if you notice something glaringly wrong, the cart was never meant to be for the ark. Now that may seem like a small thing to you and I. It did evidently seem a small thing to David. So they just put it on a new cart, thinking that this is going to be the proper way of describing. But what they had failed to do was to look at what God had said about the ark and how it was to be transported. The ark was very much a symbol to Israel. It held the Ten Commandments. It held Aaron's staff that had budded. It had a golden pot that contained manna. It was the symbol of God's involvement with the Jews. And it was also a focus of worship. It's also called the mercy seat of God. And I think when we look at it and we see that it's just an object, it's just a box, but God has placed a whole lot of emphasis on this little box, especially when it comes to how it is to be handled and by whom. Now, I will tell you that today, you don't hear a lot of preaching about God's holiness, about his in, of an ability to not deal with sin. And it's too often that when we call ourselves to worship, we have come to a different style. I can't tell you how many times when I was in leadership roles over the pastor and in the worship, I would have people complain to me and say, you know, I didn't get nothing out of church today. And I thought, you know, okay, I understand that. It's not every day that people are just floored. But on the same token, did you come to get something out or did you come to put something in? You see, my friends, when we worship God, we come to pour out our praise, our glory, our honor to him. We come, and yes, we oftentimes receive benefit from that, but we have lost that focus of the holy God that we are to worship. Make no mistake, my friends, there will come a day where every knee shall bow, every knee, and that includes Satan, and they will declare and they will praise God with the glory that he most definitely deserves. You cannot do justice to God's glory without taking some reverence. And I'll be honest with you, I've seen some of that same attitude displayed when I was a police officer towards judges on the bench. And you can like or dislike what a judge does, but if you fail to remember that the judge is the judge and you challenge his authority, you are in trouble. And I have witnessed it as a police officer and I have been there in the court when the judge looks to me and says, officer, remand that person to jail, contempt of court. And without question, without reservation, without anything at all other than what the judge has spoken, 
I would take that person to jail. And I did it immediately. What happened was that someone failed to respect and show proper reverence to a judge. That's just a human judge. Imagine doing that to the God of the universe. Imagine failing to see the holiness of God in my contact with him. Our second scripture is from Malachi 2, 1 through 2, and it says, Now, O priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. Malachi is speaking to a people who have forgotten how to worship God. To fail to show that proper respect has terrible consequences. David learned that the hard way. And a guy named Uzzah suffered the consequences. Uzzah, my friends, was not a bad guy. He simply saw the ox stumble and felt that if it stumbled, the ark might fall off the cart. And so he reached out to stabilize that cart. Not realizing that doing so, he was bringing the judgment of God upon him. Because the Bible is very clear, anyone who touches the ark must die. David should have known better. The Levites in that parade should have known better. Poor Uzzah, unfortunately, did not. And he suffered the consequences of it. And I'm here to tell you that that is often the case when people refuse to honor God. Innocents do suffer. We see it time and time again where we fail to follow God's rules. And unfortunately, it's the innocents that suffer. It's the weak. It's the ones who should not suffer that do. My friends, this relaxed attitude that today is prevalent. We want to have God as our bud, our buddy, our friend. And he certainly desires a relationship with us. But we must never, ever forget that we are in contact with the holy God, the one and only, the creator of the universe. To forget that, to take that with less than reverent respect or fear is dangerous. And I will tell you, I do not see a lot of reverent worship being taken place in today's world. In fact, I see a whole lot of folks telling me that God agrees with me, so guess what? Anything I think is okay, because God's already told me I'm okay, and so everything I think is okay. Nothing could be further from the truth. God has specifically given us his commandments. He has specifically given us his word. He specifically showed the Israelites how this ark should be carried. And they ignored it. Now, I can say that, you know, there's a lot of good excuses why they maybe just didn't. I mean, after all, the Philistines got away with it, so why can't they? And God did not punish the Philistines for putting the ark on the covenant. But the Philistines weren't God's people. They had not received the word of God and the directions. God's people had. You and I have. We have the Bible to tell us right from wrong. What God desires, what God does not desire. My friends, we live in a world that tells you that God is okay with anything you do because he's just that loving grandpa. I hear a lot of folks tell me, you know, I like the God of the New Testament, not real fond of the God of the Old Testament. I hate to break this to you folks. He is one and the same. The God of the Old Testament, 
who struck Uzziah dead, who put to death whole nations of people, is the same loving God that calls us to forgiveness. He is both omnipotent, righteous, and holy, and loving. But make no mistake, you cannot oppose those two personality traits and say that one will counsel the other. People say, well, a good and loving God would never do that. My friend, a righteous and holy God cannot allow sin, cannot condone it. And yes, sometimes my sin will hurt even the innocent. It's a sad truth. It's a reality that I must be aware of. It's a reality that David came too clearly to. I want to read to you from Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 through 14. And now, O Israel, what does God, Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and the statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and heavens and heavens, the earth and all that is in it. I also want to read Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And also Psalms 34, 8 through 9. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. To fear a loving God may seem contrary to his loving nature. But I'm here to tell you that that fear is what causes us to love him more. It makes his love even more pronounced. To know that my God cannot tolerate sin. We just celebrated Easter. And I've shared several times, but it'll share it more and more. When Jesus Christ was on that cross and he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was at that moment that Jesus took my sin, took your sin on him. And God the Father, holy as he is, could not look upon the Son. He had to turn his back. And the Son, for the first time in all eternity, was forsaken by his Father. A holy God cannot and will not be part of sin. For us to take that lightly is foolish. And I will tell you, in the day of today, with the world being what it is, I can tell you many churches that teach that God will bless you no matter what you do. Or, better yet, you know, it used to be a sin to do this, but that was in the olden days. God's changed. He's gotten more modern. He got woke. And he's okay with that now. Ah, you know what? You can hear that preached in a lot of places. And I hope that if you ever hear it from me, that I'm struck down by lightning immediately. Because it's a lie. I serve a God who, when he wrote this Bible, wrote it for today as much as he did 4,000 years ago. We cannot manipulate God. He is no earthly parent. I cannot trick him. I cannot change his mind. He is an all-knowing and powerful God, and he is worthy of every praise that he will receive one day. My friends, David took lightly the instructions of God. He was following God, but he wasn't listening to God. And because of that, a poor man named Uzzah died because of David's errors. I'm here to tell you today that that scripture is just as valid as it was in David's time. If I'm going to follow God, I better be listening to what he has to say. 
I better be following what his word says because my friends, the consequences of sin are still there. If I do not repent, if I do not accept God's judgment, his righteous and proper judgment on sin, then I am in very much in danger of suffering from that. Our last scripture today is Revelation 5, 11 through 14. And when we consider just how holy our God is and just how majestic he is, Revelation, I think, speaks it well. John is getting a vision into heaven. And he says, Then I looked and I heard around the throne of living creatures and the elders and a voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, wealth, and wisdom, might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven on earth, under the earth and in the sea, and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. That, my friends, is a brief glimpse of what you have to look forward to in heaven. We will spend eternity praising God, honoring Him, glorifying Him, because He is holy. And He rightfully deserves that praise. But I'm here to tell you that if while we're living on this earth, we try to follow God without listening to Him, it will create nothing but trouble, as it did for David. Now I can tell you, just as a cheater alert, David does get the ark into Jerusalem. The second attempt was done properly. They created the poles. I'm sure the poles were gone by then. They had to probably make new ones, and that's probably why they had an, an ox cart instead. But when they went back for that ark, the Levites came with poles and they did it properly and they got into Jerusalem. If I want to have a life that is not problem filled, that is not being filled with judgment and harsh problems, it behooves me to read this book to see what it is God is asking of me, to see what he is desiring of me. Because I'm here to tell you, he has given us the right answers. I went to school, like most of you did, and very few of my teachers would give me an open book test, which means, here's your textbook. Just look in there and find the answer. My friends, God has given you an open book test. All the questions you have, all the questions that the world is going to throw at you is responded to in that book. You just have to open the book and see what the answer is. But I'm here to tell you, too often we read it without applying it or we don't read it at all. If I'm going to listen to God, I have to come before him humbly and with an open heart. I have to be assured that he knows better than I do what's good for me and what is not. Make no mistakes, my friend. Our God is worthy of praise and honor and reverent fear and respect. We need to take him seriously and failure to do so will have dire consequences. The question, my friends, for you today is, are you listening? And if you are, are you sure it's God you're listening to and not the world? I'll leave you with that. Thank you.